Hello, welcome everybody. And today we have, at this moment, we have um, a fantastic uh, talk stroke interview on how to be mindful. It's one of the most important topics and it's something that is on most people's mindful lips at the moment. <laughs> so we have, we have Shamash Aladina who is author of Mindfulness for Dummies, one of those very famous books, as well as seven other books, amazing. Founder of the International Training Organization, teaches mindfulness, passionate about mindfulness and non-duality. And um, drinks too much tea. Well, I hope you drink it mindfully. I put that in my bio that I like drinking too much tea. <laughs> I remember being, um, I remember this old guru who um, gave his followers some um, ice cream and and, oh. and they just sort of like ate this ice cream and they were all really happy. Yeah. And and then he said to them, did, 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 you, um, did you eat that mindfully? And they go, and they just didn't. And he said, well, we just have to have some more then. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah, that's good. In fact, you reminded me. There's this uh, there's this office in London. Where, uh, the company's called Happy Happy .uk, and they do um, training, uh, computer training. And they've got a fridge there, and they've just got unlimited ice cream on tap, basically. I, don't know, I do not want to work there. <laughs> I do not want to work there. <laughs> I do not want to be in a place where there was unlimited snacks on tap. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I have to literally prepare, you know, go to the shop to buy snacks. Otherwise, I can't have yeah. them. Yeah, it's too hands. dangerous. It's too risky. Yeah, I'm the same. <laughs> yes. That's, um, in fact, yeah, I mean, we will come on to mindful eating because I think that's really important. Um, but just in a nutshell, what is mindfulness? In a nutshell, in a sentence or as simple as possible, mindfulness is about being present. So being in the here and now, uh, now it's quite hard because of most of the time our mind wants to think about what happened before or we're going to plan what, what's happening in the future. We do need to do that. Obviously, we need to reflect on the past and think about the future. But most people, at least half of the time, they're thinking about past or the future. And for some people, it's up to 80 percent or 90 percent of the time. So then you're, you're, you're hardly ever here. You're always lost in the thoughts. So it turns out it's a skill. So. Although some people, you know, may think it's very hard or very difficult, you can start really, really small and you do these little small exercises every day from a few seconds. Literally, you can start with just 10 seconds and you can build it up from there and your brain will stop going off too much into the past and future. It'll be more in the here and now. And the more it is in the here and now, there's a load of nice research is that you're going to be happier. You're going to be more creative. You're going to be more open and present. You're going to be able to deal with your challenges. Your relationship's going to improve. Your immune system's going to I mean, the list goes on. It's literally, I think there might be 10,000 studies on it now. So we know it's really good. But the problem is um, people think they have to do very long practices or they mm. think that, oh, my mind is just... Now, my mind is too busy. I can't do it, but maybe other people can. But if every, everybody says the same thing, uh, actually, it's a lot more accessible than people think because I think everyone's got 10 seconds and you can start with 10 seconds and yeah. build it from there. I mean, it's even like with like we have, we take photos now, like we're in a beautiful scene in nature and, and we're just like more interested in the photos that we're going to <laughs> yeah. put on our social media than yeah. just enjoying that moment or exactly going for a meal or maybe not at the moment or maybe just about yeah. and we instead of like really smelling that food i i went to a friend's house and i have a thing about having lukewarm food it has to be it comes to the table it's got to be hot yeah. and she was spending hours well moments it felt like hours making everything in such a way that she could insta the whole table and by the time i got to eat the food, oh no it <laughs> and it's like we can be so in the future that we, you know it's got to be for our instagram that we forget to really be here and now and just enjoy that yeah, yeah. of our life now that's interesting but, isn't it yeah 
Yeah, I think it's because of you know the tech companies they've become so good because they've got so much data. They made they got so good at making it addictive, and so we've got to a point where they've made it so addictive that we would rather our brains would rather take a photo of it and put it on their website, which will make them more money actually, than actually tasting the food. That's amazing. Um, it's it an amazing really achievement by M, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, I mean, one thing I, I, I'm into is, and um, maybe you know, I think I might have mentioned it, um, that uh, I do wild swimming. So, and um, in that moment, you that's the most mindful thing. You, you almost like can't think about the future because you're so cold. And uh, so that's a really good way to get into the body. That's a real um, good, yeah, that's a really good activity. Right? Have you been doing that for a while? Three years, yeah. Wow, yeah. wow. Yeah. Three and, then, years. and then do you feel kind of energized and relaxed afterwards? You, you, you do. You feel energized and relaxed. Like yeah. you, you can have fantastic sleep. Um, um, and also, like, I, even if you go to the same spot every single day, it will be different. There will be a duck that will go past or you'll hear something or a fish will pop out. And oh. there is no, although... Yesterday, I did take a camera into the river, but I prefer not to because then I'm fiddling around yeah, with the cameras. Yeah, yeah. But just to be really, as you say, it's being present in the moment yeah, without yeah. a phone. And wouldn't it be amazing if we could become so addicted to mindfulness? <laughs> it does happen, actually. I mean, monks and nuns, once you get a bit of a taste of a real nice meditation, you, you actually get addicted to it. And in a way, that's what the idea is, is to make it in, so enjoyable that you're like, oh my God, that was so blissful. I can't wait for my next meditation. And then it's almost like a tipping point when you get to that point, because then you just can't wait to do your next meditation, do your, your next practice, because it's a pleasurable experience. Yeah. And I think you've had that with your wild swimming. Although the moment is painful, the, the pleasure that you experience afterwards and the benefits of it, is greater than the, the pain the pain of uh, you know you're swimming along with a fish next to you or something and yeah. Uh, so yeah in fact you're really right in fact and that's very it's one of the things i emphasize in mindfulness because some people say that you know even if you don't enjoy it you have to do it it's just something you have to do as if it's like a chore that you need to put into your life but then the motivation just doesn't come up you need to be excited about it you need to, it needs to be feel so nice uh, ultimately that you just want to practice regularly and whenever you can yeah. So how how is mindfulness useful in these really challenging, changing times? How can we use it as a tool? So ultimately, mindfulness is actually the skill of letting go. And at the, at the moment, what's happening is that we've lost a lot of control. All the things that we would normally do or like to do, we just can't do. We don't have the control. So you just have to let go. But if we, uh, if we don't have that skill of letting go, uh, then we try to hold on to things that are not stable. And that makes us feel unstable. So mindfulness is really good because, of first of all, it brings you into the here and now. It teaches you acceptance. In fact, acceptance is such an important part of mindfulness. They call it acceptance-based approaches. That's another word for it. And so it teaches you to be in the here and now. It teaches you to accept what you can't change. And the really great thing I like about uh, mindfulness is a thing called a transcendent self. So we've got a normal everyday self where we're like thinking and we're doing and we're planning and we're trying to improve our lives and stuff. But there's actually another part of ourselves um, which we call the transcendent self or, you know, the, the part of us that connects us to everything else. And as you start doing more and more mindfulness, you realize that there's a part of you that's actually pure, perfect, and complete, absolutely fine, and is peaceful and still. And so as you do the mindful practices, you start dropping back into that. And then all the changes that are happening around you, they're almost like a play, a game. Yeah, sometimes things go well, sometimes things go badly. You know, your children sometimes behave, sometimes they don't. But you know that there's a part of you behind it and behind them as well, which is beyond thoughts and emotions. Mm -hmm. And that gives a great sense of kind of peace and ease. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think it's particularly important right now because, you know, when there's so much change is happening, you, you need to find some part of you that's got some sort of stability, no matter what the prime minister says or no matter what somebody in America says or no matter what the next challenge is. 
you've got a place you can go back to that's going to give you some peace of mind so so it's a bit like you know you're in a noisy chaotic house and the one space that you can go to is the cupboard or the bathroom or somewhere and you can go inside your mind and just have that space yeah, yeah. that's a lovely an analogy um but yeah. the cool thing is is it's not something you even go to something that's always there it's almost yeah. like um like, you know, sometimes you know, <laughs> I'll be looking for my glasses and I've realised, actually, oh, I've got them on already, or they're just here. And it's a little bit like that. It's it's not even like a cupboard we need to go to. It's like yeah. it's always there and inside us. And actually, we just need to step back and, and remember that, ah, oh, yes, yeah. that's it. We're it's already like, there. And they, it, it's that old story, isn't it, about the, the God said, where shall we hide peace from humans, that they will never <laughs> find it. Yeah. And, and it was sort of, like, oh, let's put it at the top of the mountains. They won't, oh, no, they'll find it. Let's put it under the <laughs> ocean. They'll find it. I know. Let's put it inside them. They'll wow. never think to look there. Brilliant wow. story. I haven't heard that story. Yeah, have you? I'm really surprised you've never wow. heard that Is that in one of your books? No. It's like a, like a traditional, ah. I don't know whether it's Indian, but it's a fantastic story, and it really gives me chills when I when I think of it. Because and I just had chills then because it's like, yeah, like where would be the best place to put peace that <laughs> it yeah. right inside? Yeah. We wouldn't inside think you. to look there. Yeah, just, yeah, yeah. Inside you and actually in the moment as well, because we're always about past and future. Like let's put it right in front of them; <laughs> they won't see it. Absolutely, yeah. And there's another Indian uh, story about the princess looking for peace, oh, looking for her necklace, and it was it was on her uh, around yes. her necklace all yes. the time, like the glasses, like but the glass. similar sort of concepts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, it's powerful. Yeah. So, how how could can we actually get children to be mindful? I don't know. Maybe you know the answer. <laughs> um, well, I think step one. I think yeah. step one is um, for the parents or the carers or the teachers to do the practice. So you know, you can't really expect um, the carers to be absolutely out of control and unmindful, and then try and tell their children to be mindful. So uh, children follow a lot more what they see rather than what you tell them to do. So they learn by example. So that's why I was encouraging, with, even if it's 10 seconds, 30 seconds or a minute of personal practice to start cultivating a bit of mindfulness. And that will, that will mean that when you do share it with your, with your children, it's coming from a place of authenticity. It's coming from a place where they like, oh, okay, they're not, they're not just saying this, but they do practice this themselves. So I'd say that's step so, one. Uh, and oh, have you got another step? <laughs> or I was going to actually ask you for some really simple practices that people uh, that parents could do, and then maybe encourage the children to do. You know, that just yeah. something that ten seconds, twenty seconds. Okay, well, the ten seconds one would would definitely be like a breathing exercise. It would be simply just take a deep breath in, hold it for a few seconds. And as you breathe out, just maybe saying the word letting go in your mind. So just take a deep breath in, hold it, and then just say let go. And as you say the word let go to yourself, your breath going out. Um, if it's a little bit longer, by the way, the noise in the background, is that, can you hear that or just me? I can. I'm sort of going through it and I'm just hoping, hoping oh. it will be okay. It comes and goes. Oh, that's all right. I, I all right. Let me unplug this and see if it's that maybe it's that yeah okay it doesn't matter um so if it's like a longer practice or like say 30 seconds or a minute then actually there's a nice visualization you can do where which is about um holding two bags so you imagine you're carrying two bags one bag represents the past and the other bag represents the future and you just close your eyes and you imagine that you're carrying these two heavy bags and then you just slowly put one down and you imagine slowly putting the other one down and there's a sense of like releasing the weight of the past and the future and coming oh, into the here and now. Is really yeah. That is really, really yeah. good. Nice so it's interesting because you I'll, I'll ask you again for another tip, but like that just 
going on with that noise you know there is a bit of a rumble yeah. in, yeah. in this audio that i'm not really sure because i'm so untechnical i don't know what to do about it, <laughs> so i'm just going to leave it so you know that symbolizes quite a lot of times there is there's like a noise that, that really like for me i really struggle with whistling so okay. it's it's something that it's like that high pitch so even if it's even though it's happy i really struggle with it and so for other people there could be a certain sound so what do you do in that moment when you feel irritated by that moment <laughs> How can you be mindful and go with it so you can feel that sense of relief when there's something really irritating you? Yeah, well, first of all, like stuff, when stuff like that comes up, the, the, the challenge or the feeling of irritation, it's not going to instantly go away that easily. So it's almost like it's gone quite far. Uh, to the, you've got to the point where, you know, you're tired or you're frustrated and, and something's now irritating you and you've been triggered by this. So to expect that it's suddenly going to go away is just going to cause even more irritation so i talked about the importance of acceptance and mindfulness so it's more about making peace with what's already there like it's a it's a present moment experience right mindfulness is not about fixing emotions it's about accepting what's there so you're like, there's a noise there and i'm getting irritated and i would say the mindful thing to do is if there's anything you can do to get away from that noise or to turn that noise off without killing anyone but actually just dealing with the situation in a safe way, then that is the ideal. That that would be a mindful choice to do. If there's really nothing that you can do about it and, and that whatever is the, the cause of your irritation is there, then, in fact, I've had this experience recently. It may be a trigger for you to remind yourself to actually do a bit more mindfulness practice. I know there was a few things. I was doing less mindfulness practice uh, a few weeks ago, and... I was finding myself getting irritated more easily and things frustrating me a bit more. And I was going to talk about this later, but then I decided, you know what? I'm not just rather than me meditating on my own every morning, I'm going to do a challenge where I meditate together for half an hour with the kind of community. And that's been really nice at the same time every day, guiding a meditation and then share having a sharing. And then that irritation that was happening to me before reduced and reduced and reduced and it's almost gone away now so it's almost like a trigger it's like hey something needs fixing like maybe you need to slow down maybe you need to do more wild swimming and maybe you need to do something different so that these triggers uh don't overwhelm you so much when mm -hmm. you feel yeah. yeah and um how, but i just sort of like also i love the concept i think i read it recently of a noise is just like a vibration. It's just a sound. It's what we attach. So say, for example, my dog, he will bark. He's nice and quiet at the moment, lying behind me. Um, and that does irritate me. But it's like we have associated a barking noise with something we don't like. And yet there are lots of things that we do like. So it's almost like our emotional attachment or connection or hmm. does that does do you yeah. see what I mean so I'm trying as much as I can to take the emotion away from linking it with that sound and it's just it's a noise so it's not exactly. bad it's not good it's just a noise yeah 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 I remember once I, I reframed something where I was listening to a lot of there's lots of car noise it's like a... then I thought hang on a minute that sounds quite similar to like a waterfall <laughs> or just a lot of water. And then I started visualizing the water in a waterfall. I'm like, oh my God, it sounds wonderful. So just like you said, you can actually see it from a different perspective. And that is one way of, of changing the emotion to the experience. Definitely. Yeah, so so literally changing. I've, I've often done that with um, car noises and it does sound to me like the sea. So yeah. Similar sort of thing, definitely water. And then, and then you just instantly feel relaxed so what does happen in the body literally when we are more mindful what's going on inside uh, that's interesting uh it's interesting because actually there's a diff some, some subtle differences between mindfulness and relaxation as well and that might be quite interesting to explore oh, yeah. but um so mindfulness is is more about like relaxation is important and it's kind of tuning out which helps us to kind of let go and definitely for things like sleep and other situations too but i would say mindfulness is more about tuning in 
and maybe, maybe relaxation is about that all the sometimes as well but it's more about um waking up to what's going on and we certainly we actually move towards difficulty sometimes in mindfulness so uh what they found is the mechanism that works really well is opening up to difficult thoughts emotions feelings sensations um like your wild swimming is a great example of, of a mindful activity in a way you're you know the actual initial initial motivation to do it and getting into the cold water with all the stuff that comes up that's moving towards the difficult sensations in your body the coldness and the pain of it but there's so much research to show the more we try and avoid difficult uh, sensations thoughts and emotions the more suffering we have we experience which is weird because of our brain is automatically tuned to go towards the pleasant but we all know that if we just sit on the couch and just keep watching tv tv after a while we go crazy even though it may be pleasant at first um and so mindfulness is a bit like that we we sit we lie down or we we do our everyday activities and we just notice what's going on and we notice the pleasant and also the unpleasant and as you do that there's changes that happen in our in our brains um one of the things they find is that the part of the brain to do with the fear response, the amygdala, which normally fires up quite quickly when there's a challenge or, or there's anxiety, that actually, the actual size of that shrinks and, and it has less uh, neurons activating in it. So you start to, at, at the beginning, it just reduces. But over time, if you practice regularly, even for a few minutes, the, there will be a change that happens so that the irritation you talked about just wouldn't come up so much or the anxieties, the situations that would cause anxiety. I, I have someone in my course at the moment, and just after doing a few weeks of it, she, you know, something happened, I can't remember what it was, but like something broke or a car broke down or something. And normally she would, you know, everyone would be expecting her to react. And even she would be expecting herself to react, but it just doesn't come up because of there's been some changes that have happened in the brain in just those few weeks. So then there's the so and then there's the, yeah. the the really interesting thing actually is what the changes that happen in the front part of our brain so that's the part of our brain that makes us human and as we become more mindful uh the activity shifts in the way to go from avoidance to approach so when people have a lot of activity in the right front part of the brain they're more likely to experience anxiety depression they're more likely to avoid difficulties and challenges and the more you have left act front activity, you're more likely to see difficulties as challenges. Like, okay, this is difficult. I'm going to give it a go. Uh, you know, I'm going to organize this interview series, even though I'm not good at technology. And even though I find it uncomfortable, I'm going to move towards it. So that's an example. And if you have a difficult feeling or a difficult thought, like uh, you feel anxious, you're willing to say, oh, I wonder where I feel that in my body. Let me feel it with my breathing. I wonder what's going to happen in the next few minutes when I do that. And when they scan people who've been doing it for 10 or 20 years, it's kind of off the scale. It's also linked to your levels of happiness. So the more you do this, the more happier you naturally are as well. Uh, and there's this famous experiment with um, a guy called Machi Ricard. He's a translator of the Dalai Lama. And they'd scanned all these people's brains and they scanned his brains and it was like off the scale for activity. So they thought, oh, there must be something wrong with the, <laughs> with the computer. And they had to do the experiment a couple more times. And they're like, oh my God. So they discovered that the more mindfulness and meditation you do, it can be at such an extent that he's almost, almost a, an ecstatic state of mind yeah. because of all the work that he's put in in the, in the personal practice. And also you can see the these um, monks and nuns and, and, and those who practice have practiced years. There's almost like a change in the face, isn't yeah. there? There's something so soft and... It's yeah. not just serene, it's, it's, it's beyond, I don't know what, I can't put my finger on it, but it is amazing how. That's so true, yeah. It reminds me, I went to one uh, retreat center, Plum Village it's called, and you just sit there with the, there's a couple of monks in our group and you just look at their face and it's just relaxing just to look at their face, it's weird. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> yeah. incredible. So, um, so we've got um, the bag, that's a lovely mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. We had, um, what was the other one? The first one was just uh, simply the breathing. The breathing mm -hmm. and the bag. Have you got a couple more that people could just do? Add yeah, there's, yeah, there's a nice one, which is easy to remember, which could be good for kids as well, which is like five, four, three, two, one. Don't know if you know this one, but uh, you start by noticing five things that you can see. And so you look, look, pick five objects that you can see and notice the colors and the shape. And then you can close your eyes 
and you notice four different things you can feel in your body so you know i can feel the weight of my body i can feel my legs across i can feel my weight of my back against the back of this chair and i can feel the sensations in my hands um and then you notice three things that you can hear so i can hear a bit of crackling i can hear my voice and i can hear someone downstairs actually and then and then it becomes more difficult two different things that you can smell that's a bit harder you might be able to or might not but then that brings you into the smell and then and then one thing that you can taste so something that you've eaten earlier maybe you can finish off that bit of meal in your mouth and then finally with that one you also feel one breath at least and so it's a nice activity where it's kind of quite expansive and then it's coming down into your breathing and that that doesn't have to take too long either and i can imagine that would be quite a fun one for kids to try as oh, well great. yeah yeah, that's yeah. A really good one um yeah so there there are a few and then you know all these activities i'm sharing these are more like meditations but then you can do yeah. everyday activities mindfully too so it's not just about the meditations but like when you're talking to someone you know when they're speaking practicing mindful listening to be really present when you're walking feeling your feet on the floor noticing your surroundings um when you got gardening and cooking are the most amazing activities for this yeah. uh, because if you uses all the senses imagine if you're gardening you can see the different colors of the plants you can hear the sounds of the birds there's the smell of the soil uh, yeah. maybe not taste unless you're actually eating <laughs> some fruit um and so on it's, it's like very engaging for our senses so it's a great way to be mindful uh and the same same goes for eating, cooking too. eating yeah yeah, yeah. Eating. So yeah. we, we mentioned eating right at the beginning of the ice cream. So yeah. how can you eat mindfully? Good question. And um, because we eat so often and it's so much part of our second nature, there's very strong habits linked with eating. So you need to do, you have to, need to um, play a few tricks on ourselves to help us to be mindful. Uh, one thing is, first of all, you could it's, it's really hard to just eat mindfully all the time so maybe you could just start with one meal like one meal a week or one meal a day and just say okay i'm going to experiment with this mindful eating stuff you could actually even start with just one piece of food like in mindfulness courses we often take a raisin and we spend like five ten minutes eating it but you can do you it for any chocolate <laughs> Yes, yeah, so you can use chocolate. It's a good one. Once I did it with a French fry, that was really interesting. Um, I went to a McDonald's and you just take one fry and you just look at it. So you go through the senses and then you smell it and then you listen to it and, and then you eat it. And then what I noticed is just really strong salt taste. And then once the salt went away, it had absolutely no taste at all. So it was just because of the salt. And the thing is that because we eat so automatically, we have to put more and more flavoring on just to notice. But as you become more mindful, just like a very simple piece of food or especially a fruit, oh my God, like a slice of apple or something, tastes just incredible if you're in a very mindful state and you do it very slowly. It's so yeah. Very interesting. Oh, sorry, I was gonna say, it is very interesting. I have done this with fruit and vegetables. If you do really eat, and eat and like chew, 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 and be really mindful that the flavor almost improves, whereas with junk food, it decreases. Yeah, that's a really good observation. That's exactly what I experienced. Yeah, that's spot yeah. on. And that's why I reckon children, like really young children, they like eating fruit, don't they? They just think, oh my God, this tastes amazing because of they're tuned into their senses. Um, yeah. And then you give them a chocolate or an ice cream, yeah, they like it, but it's got a very strong one flavor and then it becomes a bit yeah. addictive yeah, yeah that's interesting that's yeah. really interesting Probably. well because it because because it, it's chemicals isn't it yeah chemicals it's chemicals and it's just shooting up uh you know Absolutely. blood sugar and stuff yeah. uh whereas the piece of fruit has actually got much more than just the sweetness it's got a load you're making me so hungry i haven't had my lunch yet <laughs> <laughs> never talk about mindful eating before lunch <laughs> but you know what I, I mentioned this retreat center plum village where where you do quite a bit of meditation and you have meal and the meal is done in silence so they ring a bell and then you know everyone sometimes five six hundred people and you just have your food and you go off somewhere and you have your meal and it's just always so tasty and, you know, yeah, you may think that it's the food that they made. But because if you've been doing some mindfulness, you, you you're not on the phone at all. 
you're just naturally more sensitive, connected to your senses, sensitive. And then the simplest thing, like just having a meal, is just, you just don't, the last thing you want to do is talk to anyone when you're eating because it's, like, oh, it's so tasty. You know, I remember <laughs> a good few years ago, I went on a silent retreat in Italy and it was seven days of silence, like yeah. seven days. And I went with friends, but we didn't talk. Yeah. And um, and one night, it was right at the end, the, there was a full moon. And so, and it was a beautiful evening. And I went out and I put my chair and I just looked at the full moon. And I was so enamored by this full moon. And then I turned around after half an hour and everybody, we were all in rows looking at the moon. <laughs> and it was like a theatre. It was really? incredible. Just had to all in silence. It was wow. just it was one of those moments I will never forget. Oh, and I have one other moment where I was um I think it was Santorini and it was I was swimming at 4 a.m. in the sea and it happened to be that what's it called? The bio bio anyway, when you when you have that that um fluorescent in the water. Oh was, yeah. Oh uh, my god. That's like in the movies. It really was. Wow. It was like in the movies, and we were skinny dipping at four wow. a.m. Wow! Wow! And, and 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 was it like so? So the the sea turned into kind of like a started to glow, basically. It was glowing, yeah. Oh, and talking of glowing, um, I went for a walk in India. Yeah, I know. Look, I'm just thinking of all those mindful yeah. snapshots of yeah. being surrounded by fireflies in India. You don't get that uh, very often. No. That was like glowing lights all around it was amazing wow you've got yeah. you've had some amazing moments they're really I special aren't they? So yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 reminding me. yeah that's amazing and these these experiences are important for our spiritual well-being in a way because they you can always reflect on them and think back to them and they're so uplifting definitely mm. so so one thing i'm doing at the moment is i'm having a word of the day so oh. at the beginning of the day hopefully if I can do a swim in the morning, I'll choose it while I'm swimming. So whether it's um, enjoyment or love or kindness or presence, and that word will carry through my day. And I have noticed because I choose, I can't remember which I chose the other day, and I was feeling all you know floaty, whatever, with the word. <laughs> then I did my work on the computer and looked up after however many hours, and that word completely gone so it's like how to integrate when we're focused like the computer the the iphone the the technology mm. takes us away from our body and our mind so mm. it's such a skill that we just have to keep coming back to over yeah. and over again yeah yeah yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. About your 30 days to give people <laughs> an opportunity to in 30 days yeah. continue this mindfulness yeah, so like I said, I explained earlier how the idea for it came about because of I thought, hang on a minute, I meditate anyway. Why don't I? And I and I really enjoy guiding meditations. Why don't I do a thirty day challenge? And so it's a new experiment. You know, I've been teaching mindfulness for like ten years. It's the first time I'm doing this as a live guided meditation, and um, I think about forty or fifty people tune in in the mornings at eight o'clock, and we do this half an hour guided meditation where I just guide on a different theme like today was gratitude and we did gratitude for our body and all the cells in our body then it was interesting mm. we did gratitude for our mind because we you know we we fight with our minds like we like the positive thoughts but when they're negative we're like oh I need to get hold of my mind but like oh, can we be grateful for even the negative thoughts because they're mm. warning us they're telling us that something's wrong and we need to be careful that it's coming out of kindness actually those negative thoughts yeah. So being grateful for our mind and then grateful for our positive and even negative emotions because, again, they give us the opportunity to feel in compassion. And if we're feeling sadness, it may be telling us, hey, we need to be more connected with more people. Or if you're feeling anxious, we're like, oh, we're moving towards something that's really important. It's not about running away, but it's about, oh, there's something important happening here. So, yeah, so we did that today and we did, did, did different ones on different days. And um, I enjoyed it so much. I'm looking forward to doing another one in August as well. So, so what is where can people find that? Um, I haven't actually designed the page where people can sign up for the next one. So if it's they just e Facebook. email, yeah, if you just e you know go to my website, you could just include the link, and they they could just email me. Um, what's the website? 
The website is my name, shamashaladina.com. Very easy, very, very easy to spell. Does what it says on the tin, like relax. <laughs> simple, simple, simple. Keep things simple, which is yeah. what mindfulness is all about. Shamash, thank you so much. I remember at the beginning of lockdown, um, you interviewed me um, yeah. for your uh yeah you did a summit and now yeah. at the end of lockdown the tables have turned tables and have i'm turned. in the <laughs> i love it i love it no no it's yeah, so fun brilliant. thank you yeah. so much and thank you for everything that you're doing i love it yeah thank you thank you take care take care bye